Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Magdalena Madero, and I have the pleasure um, of chairing this uh, joint um, webinar on CKD Early Identification and Intervention Toolkit. We are having our first joint webinar between the ISN, KDIGO, and Wonka. Um, and we are excited to have uh, two family physicians as panelists and uh, two nephrologists, including uh, Dr. Ja and myself. Um, so um, we have Ana Maria Sebrian, who's member and advisory board of PCDE. She's chair of the Wonka Special Interest Group. Um, and she's professor at the Department of Clinical Medicine at the Catholic University of Murcia in Spain. We also have with us uh, Domingo Orozco Beltran, who's also a member of PCDE. He's past chair of the Wonka Special Interest Group of Non-Communicable Diseases. He's a family doctor, um, and he is at the University of Miguel Hernandez in Spain. Um, from the ISN, we have Vivekan Ja, who's the ISN past president. He's the chair of the Global Kidney Health Faculty of Medicine, Imperial College of London, executive director at the George Institute for Global Health in India. And Magdalena Madero, I'm also a nephrologist. I'm currently, currently the chair of the ISN Latin America Regional Board, and I run the renal division at the National Institute of Heart in Mexico City. So um, today we would be uh, trying to discuss what are the um, strategies for early identification of chronic kidney disease and what are the barriers that we have and which ones do we need to overcome. Um, and we know when we talk about early identification of CKD, um, we need to uh, think about three things. The first is, you know, we need to screen we need to risk stratify, and then uh, we need to treat. Um, however, at the present, there's really no accepted systematic strategy for early detection and treatment of CKD. As nephrologists, we have come up with uh, some uh, controversies, conferences, and, and a consensus. Uh, however, despite effective methods to diagnose and treat CKD at its earliest stages, there's a lack of consensus on whether health systems and governments uh, should implement CKD screening problem, uh, programs. And, you know, we think screening uh, is cost effective and we think there are, are currently many interventions now that we can implement early on to prevent the progression of chronic kidney disease. And we also think that, you know, in the lack of uh, having enough specialists in the world, you know, it, it is fa uh, family doctors and primary care physicians, the one that should be uh, doing the screening. And um, this is why we are so excited to have our first conference um, and our first discussion joined by um, a group of family doctors. So, you know, I would love to ask uh, Dr. Vivekan Ja uh, to give us some introduction about the, the toolkit. And, you know, this would be, um, you know, for the next five, uh, at the most 10 minutes, and then we would have an open discussion. We already have a, a list of questions that we have received um, from uh, the participants. So we'll go over some of them. And I think um, the discussion and, you know, the enrichment of the discussion would be uh, the most valuable part of, of, of the webinar. So um, Vivek. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Madero. And uh, greetings to my colleagues from Wonka. Uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar. Uh, uh, Magdalena, as you said, uh, kidney disease is common around the world. Uh, we estimate that there are about 850 million people around the world living with various types of kidney disease, out of which chronic kidney disease is the most common. Uh, and the number of estimated people who have chronic kidney disease worldwide is uh, estimated to be about 700 million. Uh, we also know that the burden of chronic kidney disease is highest in the resource deprived regions of the world which is where it is growing the most as well. So uh, what it means indirectly is that the people who suffer from chronic kidney disease the most are the ones who are perhaps the most disadvantaged. And therefore they would stand to benefit the most if some sort of program to de detect the disease early and intervene uh, early was to be made. Uh, but as you heard from uh, Professor Madero just now, that there is no real clear consensus about this. Uh, last week, we, uh, we observed the World Kidney Day, and World Kidney Day is centered around the message uh, that kidney disease is common, 
kidney disease is harmful, but kidney disease is treatable also. So we should uh, make sure that we do whatever we can to identify this condition early and, and then treat it. But the fact that kidney disease, uh, consensus around kidney disease, early diagnosis and treatment is, is elusive is illustrated by the fact that there has been actually uh, what is called a controversies conference organized around it. So Kedigo, which is the organization that develops uh, guidelines for treat identification, diagnosis, and management of kidney diseases around the world, also organizes controversies conference uh, to discuss topics on which there is uh, no clear consensus around the world. And in Mexico City, this uh, uh, controversies conference was organized around early identification and intervention in chronic kidney disease. Now, as a result of this uh, Congress, uh, there was a publication which you saw in the previous uh, slide, but the International Society of Nephrology, which is the largest society of kidney health professionals around the world with members from more than 160 countries and more than 10,000 healthcare professionals uh, interested in kidney health involved uh, with, with the society, came out with uh, this early identification and intervention toolkit, which is available on the International Society of Nephrology website. And this was launched just about a year ago at the time of the World Congress of Nephrology and World Kidney Day in the year 2021. You can see uh, this ISN Kidigo early screening booklet. This is also available on the ISN website and you can go there and you can download it. This early screening framework is developed around this heat map, uh, which was originally proposed by Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes in the year 2012, when it came up with the, the definition and classification scheme of chronic kidney disease. So chronic kidney disease is defined by the presence of two types of abnormalities. One is the abnormalities of uh, function uh, depicted by glomerular filtration rate, which is the filtration function of the kidney. And it goes from high to low. So the high filtration function is when the glomerular filtration rate is normal or close to normal, which is more than 90 mils per minute per 1.73 meters square. And you can see that it is uh, it, the various stages are proposed as follows, G1, G2, G3A, G3B, G4, and G5. And the corresponding glomerular filtration rate values are shown here on the right. And in common parlance, you can use, we can use these terms to, uh, to denote what is the level of uh, kidney function normality. The second is abnormalities of structure. And the abnormalities of structure are usually identified by, uh, by the recognition that there is increased excretion of protein in the urine. And once again, this is uh, in an escalating manner, this is divided into A1, A2, and A3. And the values here are given here uh, in terms of the albumin creatinine ratio, less than 30, 30 to 300, and more than 300. And based on uh, the presence or absence of these two uh, types of abnormality, you can classify patients into uh, increasing stages of severity, and you can go from top left to bottom right. So top left is the lowest severity of chronic kidney disease or even normal, and bottom right is the, uh, the, uh, the, the highest risk chronic kidney disease where the glomerular filtration rate is really low and protein, urine protein excretion is increased. So this is, this, this is at the center of diagnosis or early identification of chronic kidney disease. This toolkit also proposes a screening algorithm for kidney disease. Now, this algorithm uh, makes the point that uh, this needs to be Im implemented in a resource sensitive manner and in the manner in which we recognize that different risk factors may be present in different populations. So diabetes, hypertension, presence of cardiovascular disease, these are the most commonly recognized risk factors, as is the presence of a family history of kidney disease, someone who has had kidney disease in the family. And what are the various things that you do? So uh, as you can see uh, that there are certain risk factors for development of kidney disease. And people with these risk factors should be screened and these are the tests that we do. We do blood glucose to identify whether a person has diabetes, spot urine test for creatinine uh, and albumin excretion. Uh, blood, we measure blood pressure, we take a family history, and we also measure kidney function uh, by uh, measuring serum creatinine most, uh, most frequently. And we use this to calculate estimated glomerular filtration rate. 
And then we uh, identify what stage the patient has, uh, if they have chronic kidney disease at all. And then I, uh, uh, just identifying chronic kidney disease and leaving a patient is not appropriate. So we must make sure that we have in place processes uh, that will help uh, reduce the risk from uh, kidney disease if it is present and slow down the progression, which is all listed here in these boxes. There are a number of infographics which are also available on, as part of this toolkit, which you can go to the ISN website and you can download these infographics, uh, which uh, identify uh, who are the at-risk population, how can you screen and diagnose chronic kidney disease, and how can you appropriately uh, risk stratify these individuals. And based on the risk level, you can decide how frequently and how to rescreen these individuals. There is also a speaker's guide, which is available on, again, on the website, which you can use to present to various groups. Uh, one of the aims of uh, in the ISN, KDGO, et cetera, is to make sure that we identify uh, people who are interested in this and we make all of these tools available to them so that they can go out and act as, uh, as trainers who will train further people in early identification and management of patients with chronic kidney disease. So this is the toolkit, which as I said, is available on the ISN website and you have the website URL here, uh, www.theisn.org. And you can, um, you have uh, the email address, uh, info at the rate the ISN.org. So if you have any question, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us and we'll be very happy to come back to you with appropriate uh, uh, solutions and answers to the extent that we can. So I'm going to stop here and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Ja. Um, so we would move on to um, address some of the questions that we have already received. And, you know, feel free, uh, anyone from the panel can respond. And I'm going to start off with this question, which I think it's very relevant is, you know, how can we the collaboration between primary care physicians and nephrologists can be further enhanced to actually uh, help um, screen and um, risk stratify the high risk populations for chronic kidney disease. Can I just have a go at this, uh, Magdalena? If you yes, don't mind. sure. Uh, so I would like to uh, I would like to start by saying, and I would very much want uh, to hear from our primary care colleagues, but I would like to start by saying that uh, primary care involvement in this is not only uh, desirable, but it is essential uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first and the most important reason is that the most of the people who are at increased risk of developing chronic kidney disease or have early stage chronic kidney disease will be managed by primary care physicians. So they are our colleagues. The second important reason is that there are just not enough nephrologists around the world, you know, especially in resource poor countries. Uh, in Africa, in many countries, you have just less than five nephrologists. In many countries, including the country where I live and work, India, and I'm sure many other uh, countries in Latin America also, the number of nephrologists that is available to take care of the population is simply disproportionately low. So it is key that we develop a partnership with our primary care colleagues uh, because primary care colleagues will then be able to appropriately manage these individuals. And these individuals with chronic kidney disease are also at risk of developing other NCDs, uh, like cardiovascular disease. They also have diabetes. They also have uh, hypertension. And you are the ones who know how to best manage these conditions in an integrated manner. So I would say that uh, it's critical that primary care physicians are our allies. It is our responsibility as nephrologists to give them the appropriate tools to manage these patients with chronic kidney disease, which is what uh, the attempt that the ISN is making by developing this toolkit and by developing this kind of close relationship with Wonka and other colleagues to spread the message of uh, early detection of chronic kidney disease. Uh, but I would really like to hear from Domingo and Ana Maria. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Please, Ana Maria. No, I, I agree with what are you saying. I think uh, primary care, uh, primary uh, physicians will have a crucial, uh, a crucial uh, 
Oh, yeah, a crucial issue in this point, but we have also worked together because we are a crucial point, a crucial issue in the screening and also in the management, but we have to establish a, a effective communication between nephrologists and also primary care physicians. I think this point is crucial. Also working together like this afternoon that we are discussing what are what is, is our reality, what is your reality, and how can we communicate uh, more effectiveness in, in this issue. Well, I, uh, some of the patients we are talking about for screen, like a diabetic patient, hypertensive patients, or a secondary cardiovascular prevention, are usually attended in primary care. So for a screen, I think primary care is the is the is the place. No, but obviously to manage chronic kidney disease, uh, we need the the role of nephrologists. As a, if, if we have countries with a low rate of nephrologists, it's difficult to manage the chronic kidney disease appropriately. But uh, in uh, I think the most countries that have uh, enough nephrologists and enough primary care physicians, we need to uh, to to offer uh, integrated care no, between both specialties, and it's very important to have uh, kids the toolkits like like this we, we have uh, today uh, to, to manage this patient uh, in an integrated manner. So I think both roles are very important, primary care for screening and nephrologist for uh, take care when the, the patient needs the nephrologist. No? And also if we can add some things, I think there are two crucial points also that we have uh, we have incorporated a share chronic uh, chronic uh, health record i think it's important just to to work in the same panel and, and have uh, everything all, all the information uh, share between nephrologists and also primary care physicians and maybe it's also important the publication of young guidelines working by both uh, specialists primary care physicians and also nephrologists this is a very important uh, topic is uh, the first step for me and I think for Anna too, is to have a simple way to communicate both specialities. It's to easy, easy communication between the frontalists and, and one of the, of the main topics is to have a health record uh, that we can share you know, with the, the same health electronic record. And now, and now uh, we have also some some tools like uh, electronic uh, message between nephrologists and, and primary care physicians just to to facilitate this communication. I think it's very important uh, the communication between specialists. No, I mean I, I completely agree with what you have said, and you know it's it's very worrisome. For instance, you know when you look at databases from the United States, where you know you think high risk populations are already being screened. For instance, for albuminuria, um, you can see that you know only like 40, 41 percent of the diabetes population gets an albumin testing, and only like six to seven percent of hypertensive patients get screening for albuminuria, right? And so you would have said, well, you know, there's a lot of controversy on whether or not to screen because they say, well, if you already have, you know, diabetes or if you already have hypertension, then the management would be the same. But, you know, we're not even um, doing this uh, basic tests on diabetics and hypertensives, right? So how, how do you think we can further enhance, you know, this communication so, you know, every patient that has diabetes, hypertension, or, you know, it's old or has a, a risk factor for kidney disease actually gets screened, right? I think we need, that's one of the first barriers that we need to, to overcome. And I think it, that is the first step. The first step is just to, to aware family, uh, family physicians that it's crucial just to us and, re and register the albuminuria and also the, the EFR. So that is the first step, uh, step just to uh, be aware of chronic kidney disease in risk population, diabetic people, cardiovascular disease people, and also hypertensive people. Uh, and after we can talk uh, further, but the first step is just to be aware, to, to, to sensitize the importance, the burden of chronic kidney disease. I agree fully, fully agree with you. 
And, you know, I have, we've always discussed this and it's interesting because, you know, we maybe give a lot of uh, responsibilities to the primary care physicians because everyone in their specialties, right, needs you. And, yeah. you know, it, it is everyone asking you to screen or to detect or, right? And, and you know, maybe us as nephrologists, we, we are sort of biased towards kidney disease, right? But you are actually asked to do a lot of things. So, you know, maybe that this is where we, we get lost. And, you know, we have discussed this um, a, a lot of the times. And, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, as family doctors, you know, what, what part of this toolkit you know, for screening of kidney disease is most important to you, right? Because, you know, uh, maybe the algorithm is quite complex for something that you can do in the, um, um, in the, cl in the clinical setting, or maybe it's okay, but you know, what part of this toolkit do you think it's more important or that we can actually uh, promote for the primary care physicians? Well, I, I think uh, these algorithms are quite easy to understand and to use in clinical practice. That's very important because some, some recommendations for uh, scientific society are very difficult to, 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 to make in clinical practice. No? They are so far from clinical practice, no? from real clinical practice. No? Um, but I, I think they are simple and easy to, to understand. I want to say something about screening because um, in primary care, uh, some people say that we are apprehensive to use the term of screening, but it is important because the screening means including people without symptoms who may or may not have the disease. And, and as in primary care, we serve the whole population. We are so, uh, we, we, are, we are not, uh, we, we, are, we have, uh, we, um, I mean uh, that um, screening tests uh, means screen many people, and most of them will not have the disease. That's why some people said we are apprehensive to use this term. And, and in addition, screening tests can sometimes be crude with potential adverse effects and some false positive and false uh, negative values. So these are questions that we can keep in mind to talk about the screen. So it's not apprehension about, about the screening, is that the screening should be used when the scientific evidence and, and validity indicators are appropriate. So, and I think for this, this, uh, this disease, for chronic kidney disease, we have uh, very good indicators to, to screen in primary care, no? because it's, the tests for screen are not expensive, are easy to, 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 uh, to, to understand and to manage uh, in primary care. I think it's a good example of screening uh, in primary care, the screening of uh, chronic kidney disease. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, like all the principles of WHO apply to chronic kidney disease, right? It's a highly prevalent disease. You have to screen high risk population. It is cost effective. We have a treatment, right? So you can risk stratify population. So all these uh, principles of the WHO for screening do apply for, for chronic kidney disease. And, and this is a very, very relevant point. Um, you know, another thing that it's probably worth discussing is, you know, is this, are these tests affordable to all countries, right? Or how do we need to um, adapt some of these tests to different uh, incomes of countries around the world, right? You know, because the ideal uh, triple marker where we would, you know, screen with cystatin C in blood and with um, serum creatinine to estimate GFR and to have an albumin to creatinine ratio, it's great for high income countries, but you know, this is expensive. It's about $44, right, to screen. And you know, this may not apply for populations with lower incomes. Like for instance, for us in Latin America, we would not be able to, to do a cystatin C, right? But we have thought that at least doing albuminuria or in even some countries just dip stick proteinuria may be enough, right? And a creatinine to estimate GFR may be enough. So we also need to adapt, you know, the, the, the toolkit to different populations. And, you know, I think this is a, a, an important point. Yes, I think so. Sorry. Sorry. Ahead, please, Maria. 
Please go ahead. And after you. Well, it, the point is very important. Yes, yes, to adapt all, all, for all countries the, the screening because we are talking about the screening. In Spain, I think we have no problems uh, in a screening and in ask the, the renal function with albuminuria and also GFR. But the problem is that we are not recording this data. So the problem is uh, maybe we are asking for, but we are not putting the, the stage of chronic kidney disease. So that uh, that is the, the reason because we have an underdiagnosed and also uh, also in and on the record uh, in the in our patients so thank you uh, i agree with both of you i think madelena raises an important point which which does require some thoughtful discussion so there are two terms that we use often they are used interchangeably but they are not the same one is screening and the other is early detection so screening might mean just going out and looking for a condition in our case, chronic kidney disease in everyone. Uh, so we, we have to uh, be mindful that we are at this stage not advocating for going out and doing a population-based screening for chronic kidney disease. Rather, it should be a targeted testing and that could even be set uh, you know, to, uh, to write like an approach of case finding that we are aiming to find cases of early stage chronic kidney disease that have not yet been diagnosed. So that's, that's important, which means that we have to have a clearer idea of the at-risk population. So the populations who have, as, uh, uh, as we said previously, diabetes, high blood pressure, family history of chronic kidney disease, or previous history of acute kidney injury, or maybe history of uh, uh, in, in women, uh, preeclampsia during a prior pregnancy, et cetera. Uh, and, and there could be, you know, history of uh, uh, use of uh, um, indigenous medicines, uh, depending on the nature of the, those indigenous medicines. And so then we can uh, maybe use this approach. Now, the other thing also to recognize, and this was a point which was made by someone in the question and answer, is that not every abnormal serum creatinine value or abnormally low EGFR value uh, is necessarily progressive. So we should identify the risk for progression. So in addition to a single abnormal value, it is also the trajectory of abnormality that is important. So we should have or put in place a plan for following up these individuals who are identified to have one abnormal value. Clearly, Kedigo recommends uh, reconfirmation of an abnormal value at least at three month interval. So wherever possible, it should be done. And, and we should you know, uh, put in place uh, a plan for everyone uh, for, for follow-up. And we should use, now there are tools available in addition to the screening or early detection toolkit. There is a kidney failure risk equation, which is now available. And we can use that to, uh, to calculate the risk of uh, development of progressive kidney disease in these individuals. Why do we need this? We need this because we want to identify and intervene only for those patients who are at high risk of either disease progression or development of complications. Those who are at low risk, we perhaps don't need to be very aggressive with those individuals. And so these are simple tools which are now available and we should use these tools to further refine our strategy, both for, both for identifying the patients who are uh, worthy of intervention and to decide how aggressive should our intervention be. We are very fortunate that uh, in the last few years, the number of strategies that are available to reduce the progression of kidney disease have uh, have gone up, you know, with new drugs becoming available, but everything is costly, and we must be uh, we must be mindful of the cost so that uh, we don't use uh, these drugs indiscriminately and target it appropriately to those who are at high risk of uh, development of progressive disease. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I, this this is a, a very very important point. And you know, we have uh, some questions from the audience. You know, actually addressing what you have just said, Dr. Jia. Um, you know, using the um, um, the toolkit, right? Uh, the question is. Uh, how often do you need to rescreen? And I think this is a very uh, important point and what Dr. Joe was saying, right? We, we do not have a guideline or of you know, who needs to be rescreened and how often. And this is a, needs to be individualized based on the risk 
of each uh, individual, right? So you're gonna first go and do the screening and then the risk stratification and then decide who needs uh, a, a repeated testing, obviously to confirm the diagnosis of CKD and how often that individual needs to be followed, right? Um, and intervened. And, you know, as Dr. Just said, you know, these equations, the kidney failure risk equations help us a lot um, for a few things, you know, they can risk stratify the patient and they can tell us, you know, which patient needs to be referred to the nephrologist, right? Which is uh, the next question, you know, when to refer to the nephrologist. And, you know, we think that, you know, the earlier CKD stages from, you know, G1 to G3, you know, can be uh, perfectly managed by the primary care physicians and that it's only when they advance, right? And there are stages, later stages that, you know, they need to be referred to the nephrologist. And, you know, even in our, some of our countries, you know, patients in renal replacement therapy are not even being able to be seen by the nephrologist because we don't have enough nephrologists. So there's a lot of patients on dialysis that are managed by primary care physicians and internists, which is obviously uh, not the ideal uh, setting, but, um, you know, this is something that uh, needs to you know be taken into account obviously depending on the resources and the amount of nephrologists that uh, each country has um so um we have here also a question for um from africa you know they're saying you know that a lot of people you know do not have access to these tests and you know we understand that and you know we think that uh, as mentioned you know maybe just uh, doing a dipstick on these patients or a serum creatinine uh, may be enough to 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 screen so i um, i don't know if uh, ana maria or domingo do you want to uh, comment on this yes uh, you uh, um, i i agree with you we, we have to adapt for for all the for the context and uh, for to your question that how uh, what patient we must should refer to the nephrologist that is uh, that is uh, there is a simple rule that is less than 30, less than 300 in GFR and also uh, albumin, uh, albuminuria, we must refer to the nephrologist. But as you can see before, uh, in primary care, uh, we have a consultation. We, we manage many patients, many, many illnesses. With uh, uh, One of the barriers is that we have no no many time for each uh, for each uh, pathology and we have to attend many 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 patients i think that is the the same reality all over the world and for us it's very complicated just to have the criteria in our minds and maybe it would be very useful that the, we can uh, have the toolkit integrated in our in our electronic record and also uh, maybe we, it would be very useful that have uh, the heat the, map, the heat map uh, that the Cadigo heat map also in our records, just to, to be very clear the, about the, the referral criteria. Well, uh, regarding the, the stages of the, of the risk scale, it is important to define what type of stage we, we need to refer, but it's difficult to say because uh, it's not easy to give an answer as the circumstances of the health system in each country may vary, but uh, we must take in mind, we must uh, keep in mind that uh, the, the proportion of patients that are in, in every stage, as for example, for diabetic patients, stages uh, J1 and J2 approximately have 60% of patients. So if we st uh, start the the recommendation of of refer patient at the stage 3A, probably we have 40% 40, 40 of diabetic patients. So these are too many patients to refer. So it's, it's difficult to, to answer this question, but I think it's very important to adapt the, the guidelines to a, in a local manner, no? in, in, the, in, the, in the practice. No? Um, in sharing the, the decision between the nephrologists and primary health care professionals and um, trying to, to, uh, to achieve a, a consensus, no? what, what kind of, of patient uh, we must uh, refer no? to the nephrologist. It's, it's a discussion between nephrologists and primary care in, in the local setting. 
Yeah, and I think this um, this risk stratification equations can help primary care physicians to decide who needs to be referred, right? And these are pretty easy to, to use. You know, the kidney failure risk equation just takes into consideration age, sex, um, EGFR and albuminuria. And with these variables, you know, you can risk stratify the patient and say, well, he, this patient is a very low risk of progression, you know, can be kept by the a primary care physician for a longer time. And this patient's a much higher risk for progression and can, can be earlier referred um, to the nephrologist. So these are, are useful uh, kits that we have out there. Um, I actually wanted to ask, you know, in the ter in terms of, you know, we have learned a lot um, about telemedicine, especially with the pandemic, and you know, there one of the questions that we have from from the participant list is, you know, how can telemedicine uh, be implemented in this um, uh, in the countries for for doing a risk stratification or screening. And, you know, um, I think this is an important question because, you know, we could um, use all these um, telemedicine resources to actually um, do better job with communicating um, other primary care physicians, you know, to reaching more patients that do not need to come into the clinics. And, um, you know, do you, do you foresee in a scenario where telemedicine can be implemented for uh, screening primary care, sorry, for screening uh, patients with chronic kidney disease? That's a very important focus because many times primary care physicians do not need to refer the patient, just need to, to have the nephrologist opinion about uh, one specific circumstance. So it's very important to have, as we said at, at the first, uh, at the start, when we start the, the webinar, that we have uh, easy ways to communicate with nephrologists because uh, so many times we have only just come in one patient not to refer the, the patient. No? And telemedicine is part of this communication. Re telemedicine realmente, really is uh, telemedicine. We have telemedicine in both in both ways, in two ways. One to communicate with other specialists, and the other to communicate with the patient. And both are very important. So the first is that we can uh, communicate nef the nephrologists and nephrologists with the primary care in an easy way, you know. And the other that that we can we communicate especially in in countries or settings when we have patients who lives who who live uh, so far of, from the from the practice that medicine is very useful and also for older people that uh, are they are they have difficulties to to go to the practice no and nowadays we have too many technology to to make real this communication about uh, we have uh, about video calls uh, we have internet, we had so many ways to communicate with patients and the pandemic show us that is, is necessary you know, to use this, this, um, this media to communicate with, with patients. Thank you. One of, one of the additional uh, uses of telemedicine approaches is also uh, to allow non-physician healthcare workers to go out into the communities and use uh, these electronic algorithms to identify patients at risk of uh, progressive kidney disease and then recommend screening. Uh, you know, in, in some communities, even point of care creatinine tests are available and can be done. So uh, if we can train our primary healthcare workers to, uh, to implement these point of care tests, uh, for serum creatinine, as well as doing a dipstick testing for urine protein, we can actually screen these uh, people in the community for the presence of chronic kidney disease. And using uh, cloud-based electronic health records, uh, the data may be uploaded directly and a doctor might be sitting somewhere else. And uh, you know, uh, through telemedicine, be able to uh, have a look at the data that the primary healthcare worker uh, uploads, and then perhaps develop a treatment plan and it back the same way and uh, the primary healthcare worker then can implement that treatment plan in the in the patient all this without the patient needing to leave his or her community so there are ways and and we have implemented uh, such a program in india which we are using now to manage patients in rural areas with chronic diseases which includes hypertension diabetes cardiovascular disease chronic kidney disease in the communities Wonderful. Yeah, very, very important point, Dr. Jam. Um, 
and you know, other the other thing that um, we actually wanted to discuss is the the implementation of treatment. You know, we when we as nephrologists get to see the patient, you know, it's sometimes very late for these uh, great interventions to be applied, right? So we actually uh, try to enhance and try to um, make primary care physicians um, be aware that, you know, medications such as uh, RAS inhibitors or SGLT2 inhibitors should be implemented in the earlier phases of chronic kidney disease. And we actually, what we're seeing is that this is not happening, or at least for the SGLT2 inhibitors that we know uh, may uh, prevent and will prevent the progression of chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease, the implementation of these drugs is quite low. So what do you think are the barriers for, um, you know, actually prescribing and getting the patient to take these medications on the earlier, in the earlier stages of CKD? And how can these barriers be overcome? We would actually love to, to hear the, the opinion of the primary care physicians. Okay, I think the, the first barrier is that we, we are not keeping this in mind. I think we are not registering, we are not recording the, the, the chronic kidney disease, we are not putting the diagnosis in our record, and we are not thinking more, more in, in more things. I think the first step is just to screen and report in our in our record in our electronic records and after we we, we can treat i think we are not also conscious uh, about the the benefits maybe of the ESGLT2 uh, in all primary care physicians so the, the first barrier it would be the first step is it would be just to form and inform all the primary care physicians about the benefits of ESGLT2 and also the RAS uh, inhibitors in the in the in the treatment of chronic kidney disease Cadigo in the in the it's just actualized the the diabetic uh, patient uh, uh, treatment okay. and they put in the first step of of the of the of the treatment metformin ESGLT2 for the treatment of chronic kidney disease in diabetic patients, but not all the family physicians know this information. So I think the first step is just to form and inform all the primary care physicians that we now have another uh, another tools for treat chronic kidney disease. Maybe we are not we were not re re recording this in the in the records because we have nothing to offer. We have uh, before nothing to offer to our patient, but now we have more tools, more treatments that we can offer to our patients. Yes, I agree with Anna. Of course, there are countries where it's difficult to, to uh, access these uh, new drugs. Uh, I know that some countries have only sulfonylureas, metformin or insulin. But despite of these countries, the, most countries have these new drugs. No? And it's important that uh, consensus um, scientific societies and so for, um, to make uh, recommendations according to the clinical evidence no, the, or the evidence we have no, published. For example, ADA in the last uh, guideline uh, recommend that metformin is not always the, the first drug for diabetic patients. It depends on comorbidities of the patient. And sometimes probably SHLT2 inhibitors are the first uh, drug uh, for, for this patient. For example, in a patient who uh, has a coronary disease and the, the diabetes has been diagnosed just in this event. No? And probably the, the first drug for this patient is an HLT2 in no metformin or a combination, no? because the treatment of diabetes is not only one drug, but SHLT2 inhibitors must be uh, part of the treatment for for most patients in diabetes. No? So this this is this are our knowledge that is changing. It is important that uh, not too many time spent to between the evidence is published and this evidence benefit patients in real clinical practice. That's the that's the topic. That's that's a very important point, and that's one more reason for us to work together as. Uh, collaborative uh, you know, groups of uh, people and societies uh, so that we can bring these evidence-based treatments as quickly as possible to our patients. 
so using these standardized toolkits, standardized guidelines, standardized treatment algorithms allow us not to make the mistake of, uh, of forgetting the recent developments. And that is another thing which, uh, which, can, be, uh, which can be implemented more efficiently by the use of electronic decision support tools and telemedicine type approaches, because they can be updated uh, based on new knowledge. And once uh, those tools are updated automatically, uh, that information is transmitted to all doctors who are using that tool. Uh, so even if I, for example, for a, forget for a moment, uh, the, my electronic decision support system will remind me that this patient perhaps will benefit from the use of an SGLT2 inhibitor or perhaps from the use of a, of a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, because that is also going to come very soon in, in the guidelines. So uh, it, as knowledge advances, it becomes even more critical for us to increase uh, our collaboration and use of these tools. Yeah, completely agree. Another point that's uh, always controversial is, you know, should we, everyone with old age should be screened, right? Or at what age should we start screening everyone, everyone, right? And I would love to hear, you know, your opinion as primary care physicians, because you know we have come to a consensus. But I have to, uh, I have to um, accept that even nephrologists um, have controversial um, opinions as whether we should keep on screening for people with um, that are older, no, right? As our population um, lifespan has increased, right? We're going to have a lot of people over the age of 65. So should we be screening everyone? Um, or, you know, what is your, your feeling, you know, and I, I would like to uh, open this discussion for, for Domingo and Ana Maria. Well, uh, as we know, all the people is, we usually have a, a blood test uh, once a year or twice a year. No? So it's not difficult to include in this test the, the kidney the function. No? Uh, so... I think it's a recommendation that is easy, is easy to, to do in the practice. No? Um, also, uh, in the practice, we have some tests that are all together. No? When we have, for example, a diabetic patient, we click uh, diabetes, and we also we always have the renal the kidney function made no? in this in this pack. No? So I think it's important no, to have a pack uh, for diabetic patient, for um, uh, cardiovascular patient and so, because nobody forget one test. No? All the tests are in the same pack and it's uh, more easy no, to, to prescribe, no, to, to ask for, for, this, for all these, these uh, all, all, the, all the tests. No? And for all, all Age, I think age is not a, a good uh, criteria. Age, only age for a screen. No? Uh, I mean, uh, as I, as we talked before, it's important to have more uh, risk factors, no? not only age, no? for example, with hypertension, diabetes, and so on. No? And also it's, it's very important to, to, to make a difference between young patients and older patients because in an old patient, we can find a low, a low value of HVR, and it's not very important if the, this value is the same across the time. And probably we can, uh, we don't need to refer to the nephrologist. It's different that in a young patient. No? But just the question you you said to screen only by age, I think uh, we need to to have a more fa more risk factor than only the age. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, what I mean is that everybody with hypertension, diabetes, or other risk factors should be screened, right? But then, you know, older age is also a one of the risk factors considered. Yeah, of course, you know, of course. One of the, the main um, considerations for screening older people is that, you know, as you said, you know, they may have low GFR, but, you know, they may not progress, but they still have high risk of cardiovascular disease. They still have high risk of having uh, interaction with medications. You still have to adjust medications, right? Uh, for the level of GFR. And, you know, if, 
even if you restratify these patients in the kidney failure risk equation, you could see that you know if they don't have albuminuria, most of them, even if they are stage 3A, they would not progress. But I think it's important to at least um, identify these subjects, right? And this is one of the pros that we have for, yes. for a screen. Sure. Of course. Of course, DFR is very important to prescribe too many medications. So it's very important to have this uh, this value register, as, as Anna said before, in the clinical record. I, I agree with both of, of you. Uh, the problem is that what we consider as older age, because as you can say before, uh, Magdalena, uh, um, Life span is, is increasing in, 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 in all, I think in all over the world. So 65, we, we have many patients with 65 that have any comorbidities that uh, just um, maybe hypertension uh, uh, um, or, or not. And we have many, many uh, healthy people with 65 uh, age. So maybe uh, six, uh, 70 or 75 or, or of course for, it, for healthy people, but uh, it, it, it depends on age uh, is, is, a, is a factor, it, it is clear, but we have uh, be uh, established maybe uh, an older age for the older people. These decisions need to be guided by uh, by asking ourselves the question: Why would you? Why would we do this test? So, if uh, doing the test and knowing the kidney function status will in any way affect the way we manage these individuals, we must do this. For example, as uh, Professor Madero said, uh, we may need to adjust drug dosage. In which case, we do need to uh, know the level of kidney function. So if anyone is on any drug that requires its dose to be adjusted, uh, then it becomes important for us to know this. But I think as uh, the consensus seems to be emerging, age by itself is not uh, sufficient justification just to do kidney function screening without any other uh, indication. Yeah. And, you know, one of the eth main ethical uh, questions is, you know, if you are going to screen for a disease and you cannot offer the treatment because the resources are limited, is it even worth screening? But, you know, I would say that, you know, as of today, there are many interventions that are not as costly. And, you know, we think that um, screening high-risk populations is cost-effective, right? You have metformin, you have lifestyle changes, you have smoking cessation, you have blood glucose control. There are many things that you can do in over the lifespan of these patients control their blood pressure with not uh, with not expensive medications that you can do to prevent the progression of kidney disease right so we think it is ethical to screen for ckd because they are uh, even in resource constricted settings there are many things that can be implemented right and uh, and i think this is a, an important point to make yes totally agree with this yeah of course so, you know, we have a, a, only a few minutes left uh, for, for the discussion and, you know, we would love to hear from you, you know, what, I mean, we are having more of these symposiums in order to um, promote the um, early intervention toolkits in primary care physicians. And, you know, this may be one of the ways to do it, but, you know, do you have any other ideas on how, to, how can we actually um, overcome these barriers for screening and early treatment, you know, in family doctors, primary care physicians, is there anything else that we can do, right, to further um, enhance this communication? And, you know, we, I think one of the big missions of the International Society of Nephrology, G and KDGO, and also from Wonka, would be to implement the strategies for early intervention. So, you know, we are open to to any uh, suggestions that you may have as how can we help um, to, to implement these strategies? Well, I think uh, the answer is improve communication. We need to improve communication with our, with, uh, between settings, between primary and hospital care. Uh, where, for example, in, in Spain, Anna and, and me also, in my, we, we work in different settings, in different cities, but we are trying to develop uh, clinical pathways, clinical pathways when all specialists in, involved in the, in the manage of a, a disease, for example, the chronic kidney disease, are uh, write uh, a consensus, they, uh, they uh, 
they try to to agree with uh, what to do with this patient, when to refer, when to screen, and so. Um, but with all all specialists and and also the the director of the hospital is very important too, and also patients. Patients, we we keep in mind also the the patient's view. And at least uh, we have a, a document or a, a protocol that is um, is uh, responsible of all uh, specialists and also patients and and the managers to uh, improve the, the the manage of these kind of patients. No? So I think the communication is the answer. We need to improve communication with our, uh, between settings. We agree with, with Domingo and also maybe uh, we can uh, have also some meeting points uh, just in our congresses or our conferences just to uh, speak one each other uh, about what, what is our realities and, and, and discuss all the all the all the real or all the real world that we are doing every day. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ja, do you want to give any uh, final remarks? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Magdalena. You know, uh, we, as as we have said repeatedly, we are right now uh, living in in a world uh, which is seeing a silently growing um, pandemic of chronic kidney disease, which is on top of uh, uh, the the very obvious pandemic that we have all been living through in the last two years. There are many other parts of the world which will see a much more rapid growth in chronic kidney disease because of a number of obvious reasons, and those are climate change related factors. Uh, you are in Mexico, Magdalena, and uh, I think you are very close to those countries that, which are seeing uh, the massive rise in the Mesoamerican nephropathy pandemic. Uh, we are seeing increase in number of cases with chronic kidney disease in the communities in India. We had a question in the Q&A uh, from Sri Lanka about the CKDU uh, cases, rapid rise that they are seeing. And so once we have all of these, then I think our old calculations change. And our old calculations were that people with hypertension and, and diabetes are at risk of kidney disease. But now with these new risk factors, it means that uh, we, we, we have to also identify other populations at risk of kidney disease, which may make the case for a more universal screening for kidney disease stronger, in fact, especially in, in these disadvantaged populations. The other reason to consider is that these populations are often marginalized and they're not able to advocate for themselves. So it is important that the healthcare system takes care of these individuals. And once these individuals are identified, then as uh, um, Domingo and Ana Maria and Magdalena has repeatedly emphasized, they should have access to effective treatment approaches, uh, which include uh, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments. Uh, once they are identified again, they should not have to necessarily go out of their community for continued care. They need to stay within their community so that they can receive care in familiar surroundings with their primary care physicians, uh, through the healthcare system that is uh, that is close to where they live, where they work, where they play, where they study, etc. So uh, again, it brings me back to the point of the centrality of primary care in management of chronic kidney disease in all parts of the world. Uh, and more than anything else, if delivered through primary care, the cost of care also goes down. Uh, the more the patient has to come to an expensive tertiary care. Uh, more specialized uh, centers and more specialized doctors, the more it costs to the healthcare system as well. So we do know that chronic kidney disease is responsible for more catastrophic healthcare expenditure around the world than any other chronic disease, really. So it is important for us uh, as uh, uh, responsible healthcare providers to also keep this in mind because resources are finite, they are limited, and we have to make the most efficient use of those. So again, I mean, in the end, I would just say that it's critical that uh, the international nephrology community increases its engagement with uh, the primary care community through Wonka and through other similar groups. And uh, uh, we look forward to continuing uh, this engagement. Thank you, Dr. Jai. Very important point, right? Like uh, 
the cost of an early intervention, it's always going to be lower and resources are um, finite, even in high income countries, right? So the cost of kidney access, the access of kidney replacement therapy is, um, is very high everywhere, everywhere around the world. So obviously we think early intervention is cost effective. So um, with that, um, I think we are going to close our uh, symposium. I really want to thank the organizers, the ISN, Wonka, and KDigo for, um, for promoting these activities. Thanks so much to uh, Ana Maria, Domingo, uh, and Vivian Kant for, for their great um, input. And we will be looking forward for the next uh, symposium and working with, with the family doctors and primary care physicians. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Magdalena, for wonderful sharing this session. Thank you, Vivek. Take care.